there is something so comforting about growing in this world alongside people you knew when you were younger, seeing them charter a successful journey in their chosen careers. I first came to know Tati Mushesh when she was studying at Natal Technicon, which is now called Durban University of Technology, where she was one of the first graduates in performing arts. Her sterling career has seen her in productions such as Isono, Human Cargo, Home Affairs, and Saint and Sinners, amongst numerous others. She has received the respect for her craft through prestigious nominations and awards over her career and is truly one of the most accomplished actresses on the African continent. Tati, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you, Didu. Anything for you? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So you were born in Katahong in South Africa, yeah? Yes, I was. And uh, so a little bit about your upbringing, because we met when you were tech, so. Yes, we did. And uh, do you have siblings? What did you do with your So I've got four siblings. Uh -huh. I'm the middle child, typical mm -hmm. middle child syndrome. <laughs> yeah. I lost my older brother 20, what is it now? 2019. Oh. So in, yeah, the wound is still a little bit mm -hmm. more. Um, and it's amazing as, as siblings, you always think there'll always be the five of yes. us. And then suddenly one is taken mm -hmm. away from you. And it was, it's, it's all, it always feels a little bit odd to now have the even number because we've always been the odd number. Yeah. And I've always been the middle child. Now suddenly not the middle child. Yeah. And um, so I still remember 1976 very vividly. Is it? Yeah, I was five years old. And I just remember the hippos, I remember the tear gas, I remember running home and my brother searching, frantically searching for me to see where's my younger sister and all of this chaos. And finally making it home with our eyes just full of tear gas and then the water thing and and it's one of the, so if, if I had memories that are indelible in my in my mind, it's 1976. And then not only that, then I saw Gibson Kente perform at DH Hall in Gatlow. Wow. wow. And I was never the same after that. And I remember watching those actors on stage and thinking, I would so love to be one of them. And gosh, the way we used to receive Gibson Kente. Anyway, it was Gibson like... Gibson Kente was the doyen. Yeah. Like, it was just the god of theater. Yeah. Literally. I think that's how most of us got introduced yeah. to theater. Yeah. Really. Yeah. What was your biggest insecurity as a teenager, if any? How did you overcome it? I haven't overcome it. Oh, okay. Um, I, I used to have such a complex about my nose. Really? What about yeah. your nose? I, I used to feel it's just too big. <laughs> so I think... Um, I was if I could a have a conversation with someone. Yeah, so, so I think if I could have a rhinoplasty, I would. Really? <laughs> yeah, just to streamline it and make it look... Pretty yeah. somehow. I think it's pretty. I don't see the problem really. And then when I was pregnant, you know the nose grows. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember my father said to me, God, my child is ugly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. And he said it's so tough. Do you want to come with me? <laughs> and I just remember, Dad, like I mean, do you understand not... that I've already have a complex about this nose? Yeah. And then now you you like I like to get Yeah. But but having said that, yeah. I never allow makeup artists to now streamline. Oh really? No, I don't. It's like no, keep it as is. Yeah. I'll, I'll get over it maybe when I'm what six feet done, done. <laughs> just not now when I'm still alive. No, we're just talking about it. So that's when I'm thinner, my nose, like... Oh, so your nose shrinks? No, it's bigger because I'm small. So when I'm bigger, everything fits. So so the cheekbones stand out. Yeah. The nose also sticks like, out. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> the, yeah. So gaining some has like put things in proportion. But anyway, your father, your loving father, said to you, the day you don't feel the fire in your belly, yeah. what to do? You have, have to, to stop, stop acting. acting. Have you nearly come to that in, at any time? I think I question that. Uh, I question my sanity every year. Mm. Oh, this industry is not, is not easy. Yeah. It is such a tough industry. And you survived. I have, barely, by the skin of my teeth, yeah. I think. So I think every year when you do the year ahead thinking, why am I still doing this? Why am I still, at times it feels like torture. Why am I still torturing myself? 
why am I putting myself out there for so much rejection? So, so much, um, the landscape has changed completely, Dudu. Now it's about influencers and Instagrammers mm. and numbers and you're followers. you're a private person. Extremely private. So having to navigate this landscape that is, that is a South African film and television industry has really been, excuse my French, a mindfuck. Yeah. It really has been. And I think I'm constantly trying to survive within it. And then I've got the younger actors who then are helping me with my social media because I have no clue. Yeah. I really have no clue how all of this works. But I realize in order to get the work, I have to be active yeah. on social media. Mm. So I, the privacy part, I can't completely be private because now you have to put yourself out there. Gosh. I'm not yeah. comfortable. Yeah. I'm not comfortable. You're really being pushed out of your comfort zone. Completely. <laughs> have you ever wanted to pursue an acting career in Hollywood? I have done it. Uh -huh. The, what's it? The year I turned 30. What was that? So I turned 30. Yeah. I sell everything. I go off to LA. And my darling father reminds me that when you were 14 years old, you used to practice your Oscar speech in front of wow. the mirror using a hairbrush. Wow. So off I go to LA, but because now I'm on a tourist visa, it means you can't get the work. I met a few casting directors. I had an amazing time. I feel completely at home in LA. And now I realize with Tusombedi doing what she's doing, the dream doesn't die. No, it doesn't. So there's a part of me that would also love to have enough money to just chuck it all and, and pursue that dream. Because I realize it'll never die. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be on, on West End. Yeah. I know, I wanna work in London. I wanna work yeah. in Toronto. I wanna work wherever I can work. I think you are accomplished enough to live in any of those and be an outstanding actress in any of those countries. Except, did you, you know, you know the, the one thing about other countries, they look after their own first. Yeah, I know. I wish, I wish South Africa did the same, where we, we look after our own talent before we look after yeah. the rest of the world. Yeah. And I remember doing a show in, 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 in fact, my first trip overseas, it was a British series called Soldier, Soldier. Yeah. And how I struggled to get even the papers right. And when I got on set, the producer said to me, it was very hard to get you here because I had to prove beyond measure that they couldn't get an English actress to play your role that you started in South Africa. That's how much they look after and yet their own talent. And yet same questions are asked in South Africa, we don't like those questions being asked. No, no, no. And she said it was a real struggle. Wow. So my daughter, um, who I had a South African daughter when they shot in uh -huh. Pretoria, but when I got to London, they, they, I got an English young actress to play my daughter. And my husband, who should have been South African, was now British. That's how much they look after their talent. In general, we will. Yeah. The same conversation is had in business, unfortunately. Really? The same conversation. What value do you believe acting brings into our lives as human beings? Except entertaining you? Yeah. Except keeping people sane during COVID? Because without the entertainment industry, you would, what do you know, people. What were we going to do? Music kept people going. Um, the fact that you could watch. Uh, you could stream online, kept people going. So for those working from home, you're doing your work at home, uh -huh. the kids are driving you crazy, and now you've got entertainment. Yeah. So it plays a huge role. In fact, I feel um, it's almost the backbone of any country. Mm -hmm. It's the, your arts, because it's the paintings, it's the sculpture, it's the music, it's the acting, it's all of that. Entertainment generally is what people Keep people sane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was actually thinking um, theater of the mind is coming back. When you look at things like Twitter spaces and mm, podcasts, yeah. I mean, there's just the expansion. Uh, also in Twitter spaces, there was a time where classic pianists were having concerts there. Yes. I mean, it's just... It, it, it's forced the, the entertainment industry to also look at things very differently. They've, they had to kind of re... Imagine, shape yeah. and reimagine how um so what's the future of television right yeah. now so are the big films and the big networks still relevant 
I mean, I watched uh, The Woman King the other day, and I went to watch uh, Wakanda Forever the other day. But what's the future of even that? Because now people are sitting at home and streaming. Yeah. We'll have to find different ways of expressing. And now um, with avatars, okay, let's move on. Yeah. Because that's another world. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't understand that. <laughs> uh, you were featured in the gene genealogy documentary series who do you think you are? I remember yeah. when we spoke about it just yeah. just in 2009 what surprised you most about what it revealed to you about your ancestry my mom hmm. although you didn't see it in the documentary it's, yeah I discovered aspects of my mom that she would never ever have told me I realized I I know I found out and discovered that my mom was a bright spot wow so you see that that's another story for another day how black mothers hold back mm. their dreams yeah their aspirations for sure in order to be the mother yeah the carer mm. the nurturer to give us the security yes and and, and i turn around and said mom you were a scholar she says you just never asked and i realized do we ask our mothers because i think everything's so about the father the father's achievements, the father's dreams, the father's goals, the father's aspirations, that we, we somehow, the mother is just a mother. She's at home. Yeah. She's a safety, she's a security blanket. She's a safety uh, network. Wow. And then um, when she turned 60, she went back to varsity. Um, I think you just now, it, what, then it was Rao. Yes. So my mother got a master's in human resources at the age of 60. Wow. And she says, I've always been a scholar, but yes. also... Um, I loved being a mother and I loved being a wife. That's not me. And it was okay with her. And she said, be true to you. I, I didn't see the way you see it. You thought it maybe I'm withholding my dreams. And, but she didn't see it. She says, you don't understand how being a mother fulfilled me though. Being a wife fulfilled me. Uh, enabling your father to be the best that he could be. It didn't take anything away from me. That's a choice. But with me, on the other hand, I look at it very differently. And she said, but I'm not going to stop you being who you are. You want to be a citizen of the world. Go ahead. The, the sky is your limit. Yeah. I chose to be a mother and a, and a, yeah. and a wife. I just, I, chose not, I just chose to be a mother, yeah. but not a wife. Yeah. No. My mom, I think her brilliance always comes through. And I, I think my father was so generous in all this, like, making yeah. me aware. But my mother is not shy about... Her aspirations. No, no, no. no. She's never shy. <laughs> no, never shy. But we need those two. <laughs> never, never shy. And, and she was studying until, I think, 2015. Oh, did that's, you, if that's my mother was still alive, I think my mother would have yeah, gotten her, like, a PhD like, in yeah. social work or yeah. whatever. No, it used to be a joke. When I was doing my honours, she was doing her master's. Same campus. Mm, let's move so on. So you cut from the very, same cloth with your mom then? Let's move on. Yeah. Same campus. No. Uh, what life experience has most shaped you as a person you are today? I think losing my loved ones. Mm. Yo, I always try not to get too teary, but I think losing my mom. Mm. No one expected it. We didn't see it coming. She was the healthiest person alive. My mother never ate a burger her whole life. She didn't believe in processed foods. She used to grill everything, uh, steam everything. Um, uh, gymmed. At the age of 50, she went to weigh less. She lost 15 kilograms. She went to gym and she never looked back. So she was gymming even the day before she went into hospital. And I think losing a mother, because we, I model myself on my mother, the kind of woman that I am, the, the girl that I was, is based on my mother. And I think losing her completely shifted my axis. And I realize now more than anything else, I have become my mother. Mm. There the, are the certain traits of my mother and, and characteristics of my mother that I've completely embodied. You, you know, my son always says, mom, you know, you're not, you're not grandma. And I said, yes and no, my love. Yeah. Yes, I'm not grandma because grandma was her own person. But I'll tell you what, your grandma was an amazing person. So if I could be half the mother that she was, if I can be half the woman that she was, then I've, I've done something right in my life. Yeah. 
So losing my mother completely shaped my life. Yeah. yeah. How old were you then? Uh, 2009. No, I was, I was old enough. I was old enough. It's been 11 years. Yeah. It's been that journey. 13, huh? yeah, almost 13 years. Yeah. yeah. I remember growing up and a dad always said about his siblings having lost his siblings because he was, and I could never understand. I mean, they died so many years ago. Why are you yeah, still, no. until you lose, it just never gets no. better. And, 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 and to do, it's a little thing. So I remember my son went, going to boarding school and my mother was there when I went to boarding school. And I remember, you know, she, she walked into the dormitory and she looked at the place and she thought, oh, is my child going to be comfortable here? Okay, yeah. checking everything else. And when I went to boarding school with my son, and I remember thinking my mother would be taking the curtains. Yes. She would have made sure, in fact, she would have packed for yeah. him. Yeah. And she would have done a better job at yeah. packing for him. Yeah. Now he matriculated and I thought, the first person I would have called would have been my mother, mother. mom. And she would, in fact, she would have come with me. Yeah. At the end of your function at school, so so, I'll never stop missing my yeah. mom. No, no, I I no. totally got that, you know, because my dad passed in two seven, my sister two six. Yes, I remember. Yeah, and and it's like it's always like it's just happened yesterday. Sometimes something like, happened. I wish yeah. I could just call my sister yeah. and share something with her. Oh, but we always in touch, so that's fine. Uh, you studied performing arts in Natal Tech, which is now called Durban University of Technology. Yes. How has that fact, the fact that you were professionally trained, benefited you as an actor? Oh, it's benefited me hugely. Uh -huh. The professionalism, the discipline, uh, the constant getting under the character skin. A, a, a drama school shapes the performer that you are. Because you come in raw and then you've got lecturers who either believe in you or they don't believe in you, who push you in a certain um, path. So some, some, sometimes you know, you don't even know that you've got a comedic yeah. um, talent well, in you. Yeah. and only a lecturer hmm. or a drama school can point you out in that right direction. So for me, I'll be honest, I prefer working with trained actors because it's just a... There's almost like a vibe that they have, and I always pick it up, and I'll say to the actor, "You trained," yeah. how, and they say, "How can you tell? You can tell a yeah. trained actor. You can completely t tell a trained actor." There's a discipline, there's an approach, there's an ethos to the work, there's an ethic to the work that they bring. That you know, of course, there's always raw talent. The yeah. kids who come in and they got raw talent and they're amazing and they excel. But I personally prefer working with trained actors. Yeah. Yeah. I, do. I remember I used to spend so much time at the Elizabeth Snayden the Theatre. Yes. Yeah. Because of Beggy Gunner, who was yeah. uh, the other twin, uh, he used to be there. And I used to be there like every week. And uh, he's, he hasn't lost that. All these years later, uh, the like, training that he has like, always yeah. comes through. Um, if you were not here tomorrow, what do you think we'll miss most about you? Mm -hmm. The fact that I love dancing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do I dance everywhere? Yeah. If I hear music, I can stop my car and park on the side of the road <laughs> and just dance. Oh dear. Yes. Um, and I, I, dancing is my outlet. Yeah. So um, my good friend Mutabi Chalil used to say, "You're a frustrated dancer, my friend. Just be honest." <laughs> so so dancing. Like for explore me. that part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I want to be remembered for the girl who liked. To dance. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have my own private moments. A word of dancing <laughs> in front of the mirror. Uh, anyway, I was in Kenya recently and I attended a Zumba class and having to keep up. Don't, be start, don't get me started on Zumba. <laughs> and having to keep up because uh, she's so busy like learning the styles. So they, yeah, That's a very erotic dance. Yeah, I know. So, so, so the instructor came after us. He's like, "Gosh, you're a good dancer, aren't you?" <laughs> I'm like, Ooh. "So there you have it. <laughs> it's there somewhere. <laughs> it doesn't always come off." You did Zumba Bell. Oh God! <laughs> you're blushing. <laughs> I've been doing it. <laughs> um, what is the most courageous decision you've taken in your life thus far, and what drove you to that decision? Courageous. Yeah, I think being a mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey. So I I was never going to be a mother. I was one of those girls going to explore the world, travel, do this, yeah. do this. And 
2002 happened and I gave birth to this beautiful boy. And it really is, a, a, a parenting right now has got to be the most challenging thing. There is so much going on. There is social media. There is depression. There is suicide. There is um, drugs. Yeah. Mind you, did you having said that, not that they were not there before, mm. but I think because of social media, they're more highlighted. There, there's a there's there's a bigger yes. awareness yeah. of the issues that go on. So I constantly am, am examining. Oh, am I a good parent to this amazing young man? But but Sabelo, I'll be honest, has made parenting him very very easy. He's such an amazing amazing young man. Yeah. Anyone who knows me knows he he's my favorite subject. <laughs> you know, don't get me started on Sabelo because he's, like... he's he's so perfect. In my eyes. Like, <laughs> like like oh, and I'm and I'm that mother. I carry myself when I go. Have you seen my son? <laughs> <laughs> and he absolutely hates it. Yes. He hates it with a patch. He's like, Mom, please, you know, like, do you have to? And I said, well, you know what? Maybe one day you'll be a parent. Yeah. You know, my, my mom was the same with yeah. all five of the kids. She like, oh, my yeah. kids. So he'll be a parent then one day. And then I'll say, okay, there you have it. So you see, I wasn't, yeah. Mommy wasn't like over the top about just going on and on yeah. about what an amazing young man he is. But he really is an amazing yeah, young man. Yeah, that's a, that's a blessing. I must say, my sister was like that about me. Everybody that meets me, they like your sister. sister oh and my you. God. This woman used to love me so much. Everybody had to know about the so, little so did you, sister. But, but everybody needs a cheerleader. You it know, doesn't matter if I, it's your I, wife, it's like, your spouse, it's yeah. a best friend, it's your mother. But somebody's got to be on, yes. in your corner because you can't do it. Yeah. You it's, so, it's like, oh, was I that amazing? She's so, Sabelo Mushesh, you're loved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what has been your most emotionally demanding role in your career so far? Ew, Juju, that's a difficult one. Mm. Demanding role emotionally. Mm. Uh, uh, one of them, yeah. I'll say one of them, was when my character had breast cancer, uh, Tandeka in... Home affairs. And I cannot tell you the amount of domestic workers. Interesting enough, just domestic workers mm. used to stop me. A, they really thought I had breast cancer. And B, a lot of them, um, it, it kind of went undetected because the loss of a breast for them was, was tied in with their femininity yeah. and their womanhood. Yeah. Mm. So a lot of them said, um, Eish, yes, um, she has this. So, um, and then I, I played golf to raise funds for, um, so women can have the examination. Mammograms. Yeah, mammograms every month, every year. Yeah, that that role was emotionally draining. Gosh. Yeah. But there have been so many. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I asked. Because your body of work is so vast. Yeah. And then that, that, to... that, one, that one stands out. Yeah. Have you ever received negative reviews for any of your work and how did you react to them? I have. Mm -hmm. I have. I remember there's a, there's an article and uh, the girl says the weakest link in this was in Tati Mushesh. Your studio was devastated. Wow. I was so devastated because I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. Mm -hmm. I don't have a thick skin. I, I take everything very personal. I'm, I'm overly emotional at, at times. And I just remember thinking, wow. But I'll tell you what it did. Mm. It kind of made me work harder then. It's any role that you execute, it means you must almost become flawless, as if that's really possible. But I think I strive for the best that I can possibly yeah. be. So I become a little bit of a pain on set because I always say to the director, please can I do it again? <laughs> and they said, no, it was fine. And I think, no, it wasn't fine. Yeah. Because I'll tell you what, I can tweak this or I can tweak that. So I struggle to watch my own work because then I'm always critting myself. And uh, one of the things I do bemoan is the is a loss of art critics. We don't have art critics anymore in the, in this country. Barry Ronger. I mean. Barry Ronger. That man nearly got me to be an art critic that because i oh, love his work so much i used i used to literally look for every sunday is look for his crit yeah. on whatever he's watched adrian seychelles is another one mm -hmm. with dance mm -hmm. so i wish we had more 
Um, no new generation. Yeah, crit- critics, because then it'll keep all of us in yeah. check. Because otherwise, I won't know that I'm doing an amazing job. Yeah. Unless someone says, "I'm not sure that I love her portrayal of X or that or that or that." How she you know that the, the US still has um, lots of critics. Critics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe we sh- you know, kids that are uh, studying journalism, let's also s- encourage them, some of them yeah. to be uh, art critics. Yeah. Because you know, most people think, "Oh, you, you, of course, you couldn't do it. That's how you become a critic." No, because you couldn't do it. Barry Ronge was yeah. incredible. Yeah, no, he and was, I remember then I his write up of the very project yeah. that I'm talking about was, you know, it was very constructive. Mm. So you you read something like that and you look ah, because remember back in the days, um, it, it, the, the 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 critics coming out used to be such a big thing in the yeah. US. The people and actors literally, yeah. you, you perform the one night, it's opening night. The next day, yeah. it's looking. What are they saying? What are they saying? And and that that makes you improve your craft in a way. Yeah, that I still love movies as a child. I still live in the theater, and also then you hire DVDs and videos at that time. Yeah, I, I used to just live in that world. So, um, but then I changed my mind. I thought, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? Because I really did think I'll be a critic. So maybe you can do it in your other spare time. Is it your spare time? In my other spare time. <laughs> uh, what qualities do you think makes one an exceptional actor? Who are you? You. That's a difficult one. Yeah. What qualities makes a person humility? Oh. Yeah. Because in a way, you've got to be humble to take on a role. It's it's someone else's life. Um, there's a true story behind whatever the writers have written. So the the humility in order to put yourself in somebody else's shoes without judging them, yeah. to put to be able to portray that character, because for somebody it's re- it's reading true. Mm. There's a, there's somebody who's sitting there watching your work, yeah. and it's resonating. So it's the humility and the empathy to get into a character because we're such chameleons for every role that you play there's an integrity that's involved there's a, there's an honesty that that has to be there and in a way you've got to be kind to your characters it doesn't matter i mean i've often questioned some of the choices my characters make on a moral level on a moral level but then and then i think but but that's somebody else's yeah. truth you know there's a, there's a reason why that woman made that choice at that moment for Whatever reason, yeah. No, oh, I'm not that. Do you trust your own judgment in matters of the heart or work? <laughs> oh, I'm a hopeless romantic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you add another thing? You, you, I, you know what? Um, my my younger sister used to say, "Tots, not everybody who smiles at you is your friend." <laughs> so I, I really am not a good yeah. judge of character. I think I think everybody's kind and wonderful and and good and and I think. In the 53 years I've lived, I've realized people people are horrible little creatures. <laughs> people are people are nasty. People are they can. People are and and mind you, nasty because uh, maybe stuff has happened to them that they now want to inflict uh, whatever pain or wound or scar that they carry onto the next person. I've been in one or two relationships where they were completely knocks like completely narcissistic and 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 trying to understand what makes someone be so narcissistic it's because they're so deeply wounded themselves so they gotta inflict uh whatever they're going through because they're not turning inwardly and he no and it's always about yeah. you and it, and you've done this and and you this you that and there's, there's an amazing book i keep forgetting the, the title but when i read that book I think I completely understand what goes into the mind of a narcissistic behavior. Because yeah. there's a lot of narcissistic people out there. Unfortunately, yeah. It be- yeah. It's becoming yeah. the thing to, to learn about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you experience unfair discrimination as an actress? And how does it manifest itself? The unfair discrimination for me would come from the fact that I'm not Zulu. Really? Yeah. Sputla Sibokhudi spoke about it the other day. Wow. And, and the fact that... Unless you are a Zulu-speaking actress, yeah. the work is diminished, and that's a fact. Is it we don't speak about it uh, often yeah. enough, but 
on paper, it's even a Sutu drama mm. ends up being a Zulu drama. Oh. So and, and a drama will start off being a, completely based in uh, Sutu land yeah. and whatever. And slowly the network will say, oh, can you put in more Zulu actors? Can you put in more Zulu actors? Can you put in... Z so Sutu actors are really having a hard time right oh. now. Yeah. It's become all about That's Zulu. crazy. Uh, if you look at any show. Is Zulu it because dominates. of the audience? It's because of the numbers. It's a numbers game. So because Zulus are, Still I suppose they've source. got the numbers. Yeah, they've got the numbers. So um, advertisers, you come from an advertising. Yeah, advertisers are looking. And, but are we reaching the Zulu audience? Are we reaching the Zulu audience? So it be, it's become very tough as a Sutu actress. So to find tools are not an option? They are, but uh, but remember your your South African audience, your every South African audience not really is not going to be reading subtitles. They want to listen. They're yeah. hearing. Yeah. So the mo the mother could be sitting in the kitchen cooking, but if she's hearing something on a Zulu program, she's hearing her yeah. language being uh -huh. spoken. So it's be it's become very unfair. I'll be honest yeah. with you. So I I I have found it quite a struggle. The fact that so what should I be learning? Should I be upping my Zulu game? Yeah. It yeah. is a loyal audience because Ikuz Ikuz FM also their their but but but, but, but did you every every language is is loyal yeah you speak to uh, Tsonga people they're loyal to a Tsonga they would love to hear Tsonga yeah Sutu act Sutu listeners or audience members would love to hear their own language being spoken so yeah. it's really is a numbers game yeah. it's because there's a mo they're the most population yeah. So, so we finding it a real struggle to find work as a sutra actress. Wow! So then we have to go to English as the option. Yes, and that's where I'm now finding the work is when I can combine the sutra and the English. English. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That is interesting. Somebody do something about this. Yeah. Um, if you had the power and the means to fix any problem in South Af in the South African society, what will it be and why? A food security issue. The the poverty. Oh, did you? We we're surrounded by so much poverty. You know, I live literally across the road from Alex, and you just see desolation. You see despair. Because this country is not what we signed up for. It has turned into almost an enemy of the people. The very country that we all love as South Africans and, and, and regardless of race, creed or color or sexual orientation, everybody loves this country. But this country in a way has let us down. So my fear is five years from now, the poor will be poorer than they've ever been. The crime um, stats will be even higher. The desperation will even be higher. The suicide will be higher. The, the depression will be higher. And I'm an optimist. So when an optimist is saying, yo, the future of this country is not looking great at all. It is looking so bleak. Uh, the industry is not what it used to be. I cannot get the rates that I used to get 10 years ago. I mean, 10 years ago, I'm earning the same amount of money. And with the inflation and, yet, and everything. You have producers like... who are driving Rolls Royce and Bentleys. Yes. Yeah. So it's always, oh. yeah. I think that the food security element, can we, I think I would, I would empower farmers. I would, uh, there's no, re I don't understand why we're importing stuff that's already grown in South Africa. It's just the quantity is not enough. But also I just think like uh, city gardens, we don't really put much stock into a different way. If you think that the traditional way of living, Africans were quite healthy. Very. My grandmother lived to, my, yeah, my great grandmother lived to be 98. And I think the majority of us were vegetarian. We used to eat meat once in a while. Yeah, yeah. So it's just some of those practices. But it, but it was organic, you see. Yes. So if I go to my grandmother's homestead yeah. in, in Goa, in yeah. Butterworth, they still grow their own millies. So everything is organic. organic. It's just that now organic has become expensive. So if you're buying organic stuff in the city, it's a lot more expensive. And yet if you're going into your 
rural areas, organic is, it's just there. Gosh, I don't know how we're going to overcome this. We need to change governments. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> yeah, we need, we, we need to change the leadership. Maybe not governments, but the leadership. Mm. Uh, the leadership has to be uh, driven by what is what is good for the people. Yes. So my dad was a feminist. My dad used to believe mm -hmm. if this world is run by women, it would be a mm. completely different world. Mm. Yeah. Oh, our well, lovely dads, I tell you. <laughs> um, what legacy would you love to leave in the world? That I was passionate about anything that I did. Mm. Be it, um, I was passionate about being an aunt, being a sister, being a daughter, being a mother, being a partner, being an actress, being a friend. Yeah, I was, she was just passionate. <laughs> there was a passionate human being walking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's my legacy. And then mind you, that's a legacy that's been passed on from my dad. Yeah. As you said, that quote earlier, yeah. it says, if, you, if you've lost passion for what you do, then you're not doing anyone's a favor, rather stop. So... If I've lived my life with passion in everything that I do, then that's my legacy. Yeah. What's still on your bucket list to do? Okay, I'm never gonna bungee jump. Yeah, <laughs> because I have, a, I, have a, I have a fear of heights on another level. Yeah. Um. What do you do? I just want to travel. Mm. I, 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 you know, I was speaking to a friend earlier, and I just said, I just want to make enough money to be able to just travel. You know, my younger sister used to have, you know, remember the global thing and she would just, yeah, literally she would just spin it yeah, and then she'll just pick a country and that's where she goes. I'd love to be able to do that. Be it Alaska, be it like a remote yeah. country that you've yeah. never even heard of. Like yeah, like a, you know, not Latvia, but like a new yeah. Latvia somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a different culture and it's a different language. Um, I just, I, I think... Um, the the traveling that uh, I think I haven't done enough traveling mm. that do, that will always be on my bucket list. Yeah. It will always keep propping up on my bucket list. Sometimes I get concerned when I return the, to the same destination. I'm like, there's so much else to see in the world. But then you have friends that you go. But the what's the most remote place you've ever been? I don't know. I don't think I have been to a remote place. No. Iceland? No. <laughs> no. 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 I I would like to do the the Northern Stars, but no, no remote. So yeah. travel's also on your bucket list. I love traveling, but that's why I get concerned when I go to some of the places. Oh, I'd love to go to Timbuktu. I'd love to go to North Korea. Oh, hello. Yeah. <laughs> Just the fascination with human beings. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, also, and also different cultures. Yes. Like yeah. different cultures, different. Yeah. So the interesting thing about my family is that no one's married to. So my brother's wife was Zulu. Mm -hmm. My mom was also my dad's Sudu. Mm -hmm. Um, my brother's married to uh, yeah, uh, Mushangani. Mish so no one in the family has actually married another race. No, uh, another tribe. We, yeah, we have. We yeah. The nice thing about our family is that you can't be uh, you you can't be prejudiced against other ethnic groups. No, because, because my family we, itself. We like, yeah, like <laughs> yeah, it's but true. So, so family <laughs> gatherings was like uh, Venda, yeah, and Sudi, Vulu, Kosa. Yeah. Yeah, very <laughs> difficult to relax. Anyway, it's very embracing. As we close our conversation today, what wisdom would you like to leave us with? What is it that you like? If this is the last conversation we have. And this, that's a lesson from my mother. Yeah. Right? So my mother was, her thing was, it's always got to come from a kind source. So you've heard of Rumi's. Yeah. Uh, before you say anything, is it kind? Mm. Is it necessary? Is it the truth? And my mother lived that. So am I being kind to Dudu right now? Am I being kind as I walk out? Am I being kind to yeah. the parking attendant? Am I being kind to the receptionist? Yeah. So um, if everything emanates from a kind place, this world might be different. It will be different. Yeah, because then you're almost being kind to you. Yeah. By being kind to another person, you've been kind to yourself. And my mother lived it. She she just exuded it. Like, And I used to think, how does this woman not tire of being kind to everybody that she comes across? Mm. So if, if I can do everything from a kind base, 
that's something that I would leave to the to the world. And spread it. And spread it. Yeah. And spread it some more. Yeah. We could use a world like this. Yeah, there's a beautiful word in Afrikaans for spray. It's it's so lovely because it, it's, it's literally like, you can like you're spreading you ready the kindness. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's first spray the kindness. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's the perfect way to leave this conversation. Thank you, Dudu. Until next time. Thank you for making time for this episode of Wisdom Personified Conversations with Dudum Somi. Please like and subscribe to our channel. Click on the bell notification to be informed when our next episode is available. Wisdom Personified Conversations with Dudum Somi is also now available on Facebook Watch, Apple and Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. Enjoy the wisdom journey.